The date is November 6, 2001. My name is Matthew Nethercott, and I'm going to be interviewing Mr. John Barnes of Holland Patton, a World War II veteran. Doing the camera will be... Uh, good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, I'd first like to start off by getting a little bit of your background history. Okay. Where were you born? I was born in Utica, uh, Utica Yard, and lived most of my life in Utica, even before I went into the service. When were you born? In, uh, in a snowstorm in January 1925, and uh, at that time, we had uh, we had trolley cars that were running, but during the snowstorm they weren't running, so my father had to rent a sleigh to take my mother to the hospital. So it was a they always remember that to point out what a bad trip it was, <laughs> and it was you know a couple a couple miles away to the hospital. So so it, they had an exciting time. That was the big highlight of the <laughs> life at that stage. Sounds very interesting. What part of the military did you get involved in? Well, I was uh, 17 when I graduated from high school, and the war had already started. Uh, and I graduated just a few months after Pearl Harbor, and so I was still underage for the draft. And, but many 18-year-olds were all subject to the draft at that stage. Anybody over 18 was either going to be drafted or volunteered or to got into the service and anybody who was of age uh, more or less signed up one way or another. But since I was only 17 I went on to college for that fall and uh, I went to a college up in Niagara Falls called Niagara University and uh, it was a small men's college. They had an ROTC program which is a training program for officers but we, and we were required to be into it the first uh, couple of years. Uh, after a while it could be a volunteer thing. If the, but the way the war was, everybody was trying to figure out what branch of the service they were going to get into or how they were going to get into. <clears throat> and of course you could ask for a student, student deferment, which I did because my birthday came in January. And as well I'd like to finish the year out. I didn't know really what was happening, uh, what was going to happen. Oh, they gave me a deferment to finish the year off. But really before the end of that year in 1943, uh, the college was running out of students. I mean, they were, everybody was going into the service. And uh, so they closed down the college uh, in, in April, I think, of 43. So I still had a couple of months leave on my, uh, on my deferment. I went back to Utica and uh, got a job and everybody was leaving and it was getting pretty lonely in the neighborhood. So I just said, well, I better find out how I, where I'm going. So I went down and, and volunteered to leave before the draft or deferment was over. So that's when I entered the service, was July of 1943. But basically, I was drafted. And was, uh, and they, we had draft boards which reviewed your case. And, and they said, yeah, well, we need you right now, so come on in. Um, what were your feelings about the draft? I didn't have any problem at all. It was just a question of what you were going into. It. Uh, everybody expected it. The worst thing I had, the feeling I was, might be for it, you know, that you might not make it. Uh, that would be physically deferred. And I wasn't a big guy anyway, so <clears throat> I didn't expect to be into any rough business at all. <laughs> I expected to have a nice office job or if I even got into service. <clears throat> Did you expect to be uh, accepted because of your, phys uh, your fiscal? No, I thought I might not make it. I, I was really worried about that because I'm a little underweight, a little bit smaller than you are, <laughs> quite a bit. Quite a bit. And, uh, so I was, a little, I was happy that I was uh, past the physical you know? and everybody was going somewhere. Who wanted to be left home at that stage? Nobody. Um, what was the physical like? <laughs> well, pretty cursory, you know, you know, as long as your heart was beating and you didn't have any serious handicaps, so you pretty well were, were accepted. I think they were at the low point in their select, you know, their standards. Uh, 
I think they really, we were really, uh, everybody was gone in and uh, we still needed men. So uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think it was too tough. <laughs> Um, how did you become the in, part of the infantry? Well, that was just a sheer accident. It's what was needed at the time. This was July of 1943. We'd been in the war for a year and a half. They were fighting in North Africa. They were fighting in the Pacific, and uh, casualties were there. And uh, uh, as I said, I was on one year of ROTC training that was sort of, uh, we had a class a couple times a week, and we actually drilled on the football field a little bit. <coughs> and the uh, interviewer at the Fort uh, uh, Camp Elton, which was out on Long Island, where I where I was taken for what was called the induction center, uh, they did a lot of tests and so forth, and the interview with you, and they said, well, you have any, ever you have any military experience? And I said, no. And then I remembered that I had this ROTC training for a year. The only thing I ever got out of it was you wore a uniform and you could get into the movies for cheaper prices at that time. Uh, but I really didn't learn very much in that hat year uh, about the military training. But I told them that, yes, that's what it was, and the book had a cross rifle in it. Because uh, I didn't even know what branch of service was. I didn't really that know that much about it. He said, oh, well, that was the infantry, so. Most of us were shipped down into the infantry and king in the training camps at that time. That was what was needed. So, so I spent, I think it was 17 weeks in South Carolina training. And it was a regular basic infantry training. What was a uh, normal day of training like? Oh, it, it varied, but basically it was hike, hike, hike all over the place and, uh, and learn the weapon and, uh, you know, the M1 and, uh, and the, uh, the rifle and the machine gun and the mortar, hand grenade firing. And, uh, you know, they put you through a very pretty rugged thing. In fact, I began to gain weight. I was, I got up to 135 pounds. I thought I was pretty heavy. And because I was eating meals twice in, you know, seconds and everything like that which I had never done at home. So it was, it was a pretty, yeah, but, you know, everybody seemed to make it okay. There are a few dropouts, but not many. Did you uh, see any of your friends when you were? No, no, it was a total, uh, total new environment. I had met young men that, uh, from all over the country, from Ohio. Uh, best friend at that time I think I had was from a fellow from Canton, Ohio. And uh, they were from New York City, and uh, nobody from my hometown. So I was, you know, on, on your own, totally on your own. Something the first time I ever, you know, ever happened to me. I hadn't done anything like that. Everything else was with friends and so forth. But it was a, it was a you know, tough experience, uh, but everybody got along. Because we're all in the same boat. After you finished your training, did you have any uh, time to go back and visit your parents before you went? No. <clears throat> well, yeah, actually I did. What, I, what happened was I took a test and, somebody, and the, the, they gave me a good mark and a test and said, well, you can go in the Army Specialized Training Program. Let's go back to college and maybe take some kind of a course or something else. And about a half a dozen of us had been selected out of the training at the end of the training cycle to go into the specialized training. We had no idea what it was, but it was going back to college and getting out of the infantry anyway. And then after a week or so, they said, "Yeah, you guys are going back to to be a to be an infantry." So they sent us to Fort Meade, and this was about uh, November, December, in 40, uh, 43. And I got us, I got a 24-hour, 48-hour pass, which from Fort Meade, Maryland, took me about 24 hours to get to Utica. <laughs> and I did, and that was the last trip I made home. And, then, and from there we went to New York and ended up port of embarkation into Europe. Of course, we had no idea where we were going, no idea. Even when I came home, I, I knew I was going to be shipped out somewhere, but I had no idea. It might have been the Pacific, it might have been. So the result of what, what happened there was that I even lost contact with those fellows that I had trained with, except for six or seven of us. And so just a group of us sort of hung, stayed together. In fact, this uh, man here, uh, Dr. L. Baumgartner, 
went overseas with me. He was in the same group, trained in South Carolina, and we all went over. But we got on a big boat. It was about, uh, I'd say, 14,000 troops on board the uh, Ile de France, which was a big ocean liner at the time out of New York. So we were just six or seven guys. You know, we're all, all again, in the same boat, just sort of loose. And uh, in what was going to be called a replacement system, which was, was you were sent over and eventually get into some kind of a unit. But at that time, we were in no unit at all. We were just, uh, just replacements. So you left from <coughs> New York? I left from New York and about six six day trip on, on the ocean. It was pretty fast. We didn't have too many. Uh, we weren't in a convoy. We were in a fast liner. So we landed in, sometime in, uh, in January in Scotland. And again, as a, we were just replacements, so we were just shipped around for a couple of different bases in England until we were finally sent to a, uh, a unit to be assigned to a unit. And it happened to be this unit that was in southern <coughs> England at the time. And this unit had been over since September 1942. So this is a year and a half later. They've been over for 18 months in training for which was the coming invasion. So we joined them as just replacements. Yeah, that, you know. What was life on the ship like? Pretty crowded. <laughs> you mean you want to take a take a view of this this room here and put six monks up or more? Wow! And figure out and then get them about that far apart, and you figure that uh, it's it's pretty crowded. In fact, we didn't get up on the deck, which was you know how many decks were there in this ship? Probably. I don't know, 15 decks or something like that. <clears throat> and uh, I think we got on deck once in the whole trip on the top of where you, where you could actually look out and see the ocean. So it was crowded and it was a, it was a mass you know, production you know, movement. So we didn't get to circulate too much. Do you uh, have any memories of uh, being sick on the ship? One thing I, you know, everybody, you know, dealt with that and I got to the point where I would go to the you know out in, the, in, the, in one of the open spots which they had a lot of them and I said well I guess I better keep eating best thing is keep eating and I never did end up uh, throwing up in my life and I spent a lot of time later on in, on the ships uh, even on data I didn't get sick close very close <laughs> but gently I, I didn't have that problem What was the new environment in Scotland and England like? Well, again, uh, we got in as replacements into the 1st Battalion, which A Company was one company, A, B, C, and D, uh, in a small village in uh, I called Ivy Bridge. It's a typical English village, very small, about 12 miles uh, west or east of, uh, no, west of Pro Plymouth. And it was right on the edge of the moors. You've heard of Dark Moor and those places. Of, uh, some of the stories you've read about England in the southwest Devon. Uh, it was pretty barren and uh, forbidding kind of land. Our, we never really did get trips to uh, Ivy Bridge, which is only just down the road, because at this stage <clears throat> the unit had been over there for a long time. And being a southern unit, it, often got into difficulties in towns, in the pubs, especially with blacks in, in the, uh, who were in our army units around there, and they would get into fights at different times. And uh, we were barred from at the stage of already uh, from going into that village for, for any kind of passes. <clears throat> but they would let us go to other towns to take a train. And so it was very easy to get around to England, even in, in the wartime, on trains. But they were only for 24-hour passes or 12-hour passes at the most. I don't, I don't think we ever had it. I ever had a 24-hour pass. But the training was rather rough uh, to begin with. Anyway, most of our time was spent in training and in getting ready for the invasion. That was the biggest problem we had, or I had, was coming to grips with the idea that this unit was going to be in the invasion. And, uh, and we were not accepted at first as New Yorkers or outsiders. 
Most of the men were, were, you know, knew each other fairly well, had been training for quite a while, and uh, <coughs> we, uh, they, uh, we, we almost became overstrength. Uh, in fact, I was assigned to overstrength for a while, uh, which meant that I wasn't in any unit, and the invasion was going to take place. And then after the invasion, we would land a few hours later, and actually the fifth wave, and take the place of anybody who had been injured or killed in the landing or something like that. So an, a company was made up of about 180 men, and they had a 220-man uh, roster, or whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> so we 20 or so were just extra. But then at the very last minute, just before the invasion, somehow I got into one of the boat teams out of overstrength and into the regular landing. <coughs> and, and I hadn't really practiced very much with that group. So it was a, sort of a catch-as-catch-can kind of thing. Well, a lot of groups and a lot of men were well prepared. Some of us weren't well prepared. Uh, but, you get, but when things happen, they happen, and uh, you do what you have to do. What type of practicing and training did you do? Before? Well, we did a lot, a lot of, uh, well, well, originally, uh, infantry companies are broken up into platoons. We have four platoons, three rifle platoons, and one weapons platoon. <coughs> 30 men, about 30 men in each platoon. Then there are 12, and then there are three squads in each platoon, so you're in a squad of about 12 men. There should be 36 men in a platoon. <coughs> But for the practice of the invasion, they, they divided us, instead of platoons, into boat teams. <clears throat> now each boat team had about 30 men, in, so 30, and then we had six boat teams. And we just practiced uh, coming out of the boat, landing, what we knew we would have to do to get through these pillboxes and defenses that the Germans had designed. And the, uh, we had a pretty good idea of what they were planning and what they had, their pictures had taken from low-level plane flights going at the, uh, along the shore in France. So they knew what was pretty much there, and we knew the spot we were supposed to go to. They didn't tell us where that spot was, but we, we had a good picture of it. So that we came out, we knew we had to cross the beach, we knew we had to go across the seawall, we knew we had the pillbox here and there. And we knew what our object was to get to the pillbox and to, to, to capture. So every man had a job, just like a football team. You know, you know the guard does something, <clears throat> the ends do something else, the backs do something else. We had <clears throat> a draw role. And my role at the, uh, in the beginning in, of the training was just to be a rifleman. And so we were in the front of the boat, it's an imaginary boat now. <clears throat> And the ramp would be said, ramp is down, and off we would go, just filing off into three columns, like. And the first men off would be the riflemen, uh, and they'd just lay on the ground and start firing ahead, while the other fellows behind had special jobs. One of them was a wire cutters, and they had special long uh, players which would cut the wire. <clears throat> and these men also had what were called Bangalore torpedoes, which were pipes fill the TNT, and you could screw a six-foot length of pipe to another six-foot length of pipe, and another one, and push it ahead, and put it under the barbed wire, and then pull the fuse, and it would blow a path this way. It would just blow this way, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and anybody back here wouldn't be hurt, <clears throat> but it would blow the barbed wire. <clears throat> and that would, excuse me, that would, uh, that would begin the first breach. And then the next men would come in with machine guns and, and the light machine gun and a mortar set up and start firing at the objective, the, the pillbox. Then the last group would be the ones who would assault the pillbox itself, the flamethrowers and the uh, demolition team. That would be the last group coming out, and they would have a big satchel charge of TNT. And uh, they would try to get as close to the pillbox as they could and throw it into the hole. Uh, and we would we'd practice this over again igniting the last charge and somebody would holler, holler out the fire in the hole and uh, that would be, we would hopefully get that pillbox knocked out. And we had to get, we knew we had to get across the beach through that uh, fire to get to the uh, pillbox.
So that was the whole plan. It was just like a football, you know, design of, of a play. And everybody had their job. The only problem is I got out of that boat and got into another boat, which my job became assistant flame tour. So there were two men. Uh, and so I was toward the rear of the boat with the other fellow who actually was the flamethrower, and I was to uh, operate the, the, that weapon. Flamethrower was one of the brilliant ideas of some general. And of course, they used them in the Pacific. But I have never heard of any team that landed on Omaha, and every boat that landed in the first wave all across Omaha had a flame throwing team. Never heard that they ever did get to a pillbox and use it. Most of them dumped it right away because it was so heavy, about 50, 60 pounds. Wow. And uh, it was, you know, two tanks on your back and uh, got a little hose to fire. And most of them just couldn't get through the water. Uh, they were landed and, and, and dumped it. Oh, well. So it was one of the one. It was one part of the plan, but it was part of the plan that naturally didn't work in reality. But that was my job at the at the very end on, on uh, boat team number five. I was flamethrower assistant. Um, when you got to Normandy, is there a specific beach that you landed on? Yeah, we had a. Uh, we had, a, I don't know if I have it here, but we had a whole uh, plan of, of where we were going to land. Our beach was called Dog Green, uh, which is the beach that uh, the movie Private Ryan focuses on. And that's what they noticed at Dog Green Beach. And uh, there, were dog, there, was, there were three sectors of green. Of, uh, there was Dog Green, Dog White, and Dog Red. And there was Easy Green, Easy White, Easy Red. And they were all subdivided into sectors. So you could take this whole grid and put it anywhere, you know. Uh, but the selection was the the, uh, the coast along from Verville, from the River Veer over to Lahar, practically. And the British were in the far left. And the British Canadians landed on uh, three separate beaches that they had on their far left, as far as uh, close to the, not at Lahar, which would be a major seaport, but to the left of Lahar or to the east of Lahar. And then we landed in this uh, narrow area, in which was one American beach, the Omaha Beach. And we were to land with the 1st Division on our left and the 16th Infantry Division, or Infantry Regiment of the 1st Division. So one regiment landed on our left, and we were the 116th Regiment that landed on the right of this Omaha Beach in Minnesota. Our sector turned out to be right in front of the village of Verville, somewhere, which was a little village on the hill, and there was a draw, or two or three draws, leading up the bluffs to this village. Just one going up to the village, and then several others going off to the left and right. And then to our far right, or to our immediate right, I would say, the bluffs began. Uh, not, not the cliffs were on our right, and we weren't going to try and scale those cliffs. But the bluffs were straight ahead, and they were rather gentle slopes. But they still required quite a climb to go, to go up to the top of it. But it was at the draws, that is, you know, a draw is it's a narrow file, the file up to the hill. <clears throat> and there were roads leading up to the top of the bluffs, and the one road we had led up into the village of Vareville. So Vareville was easy to spot because it had a church. You could see the, the steeple. And it had a few houses here and there along the draw. And, uh, and of course, the Germans had built the, along the edges of the draw their, their pillboxes. So we, we had a good idea of you know, the, the, the whole layout of the land. We really thought it had, we had a good idea of where we were going. How far back did the boats drop you off before? <clears throat> well, we went over uh, from England on a small ship called a troop ship. It was bigger than a lot of people here of the LSTs and so forth. It was a good size, probably carried 3,000 men. And this ship dropped us off about five miles out in the channel into smaller boats called LCVPs, uh, Landing Craft Vehicle and Personnel. That was the American Higgins boat, and it's a famous one that was built in, in, in New Orleans. And they built thousands of these and used them for the landing. The only thing is, we were on a British ship, and the British ship uh, 
head on their David's, you know, slung us alongside. Six or eight smaller uh, of this type craft, but they called them LCAs, or the British style of the same boat, and it was called a landing craft assault. About the same size, 30 men could get into this boat. So our job was, uh, our, that was our vehicle to get into the beach. Now this, this boat, the LCA and the LCBPs, the Higgins boats, had ramps, which they could drive right up on the shore, powered by a couple of engines, a couple of good engines, could drive right up on the shore and drop the ramp and then we'd walk off. And we practiced on these boats many times. I would say the unit, the unit probably practiced a dozen times by going out into the channel in the practice, or actually the practice area was a little round in a bay, or not a channel, not on the channel, but over in the, in the, in the I guess, Bristol, which would be one of the peninsulas of southwest England. <clears throat> and there were some practice beaches there, that quite a bit like the Normandy area. So we practiced on those beaches. I only ran two dry runs, we call them dry runs, you know, they were not the real thing. Mm -hmm. I only ran two of them. Uh, but the, the company ran probably eight or ten of them. So we had a good idea of what it was like to jump off a boat and onto the shore. The actual uh, landing, of course, in my case, was the most fortunate thing in my life, because the boat team number five didn't make it to the shore at all, to the Normandy shore. Uh, about a thousand yards offshore, with daylight, was already, you know, we'd, we'd, we had launched off the troop ship at four o'clock in the morning. And, and these small boats circled around and circled around until about six. And then at six we started in. We were supposed to land at 6.30. And about, not having my time right, but 6.15 or so, somewhere maybe 1,000, maybe 2,000 yards out, our boat took water. For some reason started down. Different people had different stories as to why it sunk but it sank within ten, five minutes, less than five minutes. We were all in the water in less than five minutes. And we were floating around, and my fortune was to be floating around on our flamethrower, which had been wrapped with two life preservers. Uh, and we had rifles, and we had other things that were all wrapped in with life preservers, which would float, and for just an occasion like that, if, if we got into the water where it was too deep or something. Normally, we would have, if we got right at close to the shore, we would have taken those off, of course, and prepared to land. But we were just before that stage. We hadn't yet prepared to land. And I would say we were 2,000 yards off shore. So that when the boat went down and we all floated to the surface, except for one man who was the radio man, who apparently had strapped the radio on his back and got caught in the undertow, or not the undertow, but some of the the other trappings of the boat <clears throat> never did come up. Uh, we were all we were all floating safely in the water, and at one at a short stage we heard the firing begin, and so we know knew that the other boats had landed, and that's all we knew, and we were even not under fire, uh, because it like I say two thousand yards out, you know, we were not any other than floating around and just wonder what's going to happen to us. We were not in any trouble. And then something odd happened that I've never figured out for 50 years, but I finally did, was that the, some of the empty boats, the landing craft that were coming back from the shore, empty, now going back to the troop ships. So they stopped and picked us up because the other boats going in were all loaded. There was nobody going to pick us up on the way in. They, they happened to be the same boats that dropped the other, some of the other A Company off at the shore at 6.30. The fact the English officer, the British officer in charge of those six boats had seen us go down and he said, I'm going back when I get the chance when we're heading home, I'm going to pick them up. And so it may have been an hour, it may have been two hours, we don't, I don't know, I have any idea how long it was. But we knew we were too far out to swim in when we just waited to be picked up, and we were by those very same boats that had dropped the company off. We got back on this very same troop ship we had gotten off at 4 o'clock in the morning, and it was about noon that day that I had not thought to wonder what time it was. And uh, by that time, we had no chance of, of going back in. There was no plan to send us back in. 
the captain wanted us to get off the ship, but we didn't have any way of getting off the ship, so he took us back to England by that evening, or that next morning, rather, the 7th of June, the 29 of us that were still, uh, were, you know, remnants of that boat, five, uh, were back in England. So I could write my mother, tell her I was speechless. So that's my story. For that point, what I was going to say is that I could tell her I was somewhere in England, okay, mm -hmm. on the 7th of June. So she reading the paper that I'm telling her I'm in England, she knew I wasn't there. So she thought I wasn't there. Because that's all we could say. We could never say where we were. We could always write somewhere in France, somewhere in England, and on the top of our letter, we couldn't tell them where we were anyway. So that's what I thought was good. So, does that take you anywhere? Or? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, on your questionnaire, you wrote down Arrowhead uh, under yeah. Normandy invasion. Yeah, and uh, this is the, uh, the uh, I don't know whether you can focus on that or not, but that is the campaign ribbon of the European theater. And for each campaign or battle that you were in, you were awarded a star, or what they changed it to an arrowhead for the for the invasion. So anybody who participated in the invasion in any way was awarded an arrowhead. So that is one one of the one of the campaign ribbons really. And then I guess the others were for different campaigns through Normandy. Then we had a campaign in Brest out in the Britain Peninsula. Then we had a campaign in Central Europe going across Europe, Holland and that area. Then a final campaign, I think, in, some, in the Rhineland. So there ended up being four campaigns in the European theater, which I got into all of them, some way or another. Do you have any other fond memories of Normandy? The only ones I have are those that I've acquired since 1979 when I visited uh, Normandy uh, for the first time after the war, and that was the occasion of the 35th anniversary of D-Day. And every year they have a ceremony that takes place on the British beaches and then the American beaches. And uh, it's quite a big thing over there in France. And of course the biggest thing one for all Americans, I think, was the 50th anniversary, uh, which is uh, 1994 which I was fortunate to be able to go back and visit. In fact, I have been to Normandy five times, not counting my war experiences, and I have no fond memories of Normandy during the war at all. There were very little contact with the citizens, the civilians. Most of them hid somewhere. And as, as soon as we were in the Germans and we were involved in battle, they, they tried to hide somewhere. They didn't all succeed. Many of them, of course, were in prisons, in fact, uh, by the Germans. But uh, the general civilian population, we had very little to do with it because we, they were gone. They just that evaporated, as it, it were. At least we didn't see too many of them. Later on, as, we, as I got a little more familiar with how, how things worked, everything, they ran into people back but even so, on the battlefront, you didn't see any civilians to speak of. <coughs> so I haven't uh, fond memories. Uh, no. Uh, after the Normandy invasion, you went back to uh, England. What were your assignments? Well, we were just 29 people who were part of A Company, and we knew we had a sergeant who was in charge of our company. The officer had actually hitchhiked his way back into France, into Normandy on his own. He said, I'm leaving, I'm going to pick up a rifle, and I'm going, you guys stay together, go back and get re-outfitted. You had, we had no weapons, no helmets, no, nothing except the bare clothes, the whole clothes that we had, which were pretty wet. And uh, so we had to get re-outfitted. We did not get assigned to any place except to go back to, and we wanted to go back. Uh, the sergeant that I'm speaking of was a Sergeant Roy Stevens, 
who was still living in Bedford, Virginia. But his brother, Ray, was on board another uh, landing craft in, a, in the same company, his twin brother. So he had every reason to want to go back to a company, and he is, was in charge of our group, what, such as we were. And so we're traveling on our own, more or less, to get back to, uh, we, had, we had to wait to get a space on the board ships that were going, going off, you know, they were, by this time. And it was about five or six days before we were able to get re-outfitted, anybody knew what we were doing, and of uh, course we were all in good shape, I mean, we were, none of us were hurt. We were shook, but we're not hurt. Um, so we, our, our goal was to get back to the unit. And uh, by this time, now, five days later, or six probably, when we landed, the beach had been secured. The kind of units had moved in at, to 15 miles inland anyway. There were all kinds of uh, artificial harbor op operations going on. We, since we had landed on a shore that did not have a port, you know, just little fishing villages, in order to bring in thousands of troops and thousands of tons of supplies day after day, they had to create two artificial harbors, which they did there. And that was one of the unique uh, creations of the of technology that the United States and the British did to land on an un, uh, uh, without any uh, support port, uh, port facility but to land all those troops on just an artificial harbor, which was created in that area. They brought <laughs> ships over, filled them with water, and sunk the old ships, creating a, water, a barrier, a breakwater. Mm -hmm. And they had these various uh, other machines which floated back and forth or drove back and forth from the big troop ships or the supply ships. And then they had ships that were called LSTs that you may have heard about that had quite a large capacity and could actually ram up on the shore, open their big doors, their, the doors were as wide as this room, to drive a tank out onto the, or anything else, trucks, guns, and weapons. So by this time, five days or to six days later, it was a huge apparition going on that wasn't there on D-Day. And it had all been built in that same time, that time. And so we just got on a troop ship from Southampton, England, went over, got ourselves moved up to the unit, found where the unit was, we joined the unit, went back to our battalion, found the company, went into line on the company, and at this stage in the company, although I didn't know what was going on, I could, did not find anybody that I knew, except the men that had come with me. And so we were just replacements, the company, and this was the whole idea of the United States Army at the time, had been re Placed the whole company. The only ones that I knew were the cooks, and they, of course, weren't on the line in the supply sergeant. So they told us there isn't anybody left. Now the truth is there were a couple of fellows that still were there, or had made their way back too. And during the course of the, the whole rest of that year, some guys came back. The officer that I talked about that went in and that was in charge of our boat, mm -hmm. who went in like hitchhiked his way in. He lasted three or four days, was wounded, and he and I came back since September from, a, from wounds. I, I was wounded in the meantime and uh, came back a second time to the company. And uh, he, he uh, rejoined the company and I rejoined the company again in September after being uh, slightly wounded. And so there was constant replacements all the time. Every time we had a battle, and I told you that there were probably 180 to 200 men in a company. Seldom at this stage did we ever have more than 100. And after a uh, serious battle, we would be down to 50. And then they'd just bring in more replacements. So Company A stayed on the line, but the men came in and out. You know, as they were killed or wounded or left or came back, or didn't come back. Many, many cars didn't come back. So uh, one of the things that happened was, was that I had no personal contacts with really deep friends. People I knew, yes, but uh, I didn't uh, manage to keep any uh, friends. Kept, kept going. Uh -oh. So, Sorry, where did I take you? <laughs> um, 
I'm curious, what type of wound did you receive? Uh, no other, I guess I can tell you as a adult. Uh, I got, uh, we, were, we, were, we were pulled off the line. After we came back and we rejoined the company, they were actually on the line, up in about 15 miles uh, inland, about a couple miles from St. Lo, which was a major city that we were going to try to capture and break out of this invasion area. And <clears throat> about the 1st of July, they pulled us back off the line, maybe later on, uh, in the first week of July, they pulled us back a couple of miles into a, a rest area to regroup and prepare for the jump off against St. Lo, a major, a major city. So the night before the jump off, we were, uh, I was in the, in the tent, uh, sleeping in a pup tent with a fellow named Billy Taylor from Richmond, Virginia. And he, uh, he and I crawled in the tent for the night and we knew we were going to move off in the morning. During the night, the Germans started dropping some artillery in. Now, we had lived on the ground because we were a mile back. And uh, we thought, well, gee, we're not going to have any problem. But they, we started moving tanks up, which made a lot of noise at night. And the Germans heard all that noise and started laying in the broad. And so uh, they said to Billy, we better get into a hole, which was just a little bit off away from us. And we, so we crawled out of the, our pup tent and got over to the hole, and I thought I'd get up and relieve myself before I settled down for the night. And just as I'm standing up there, I, we just sort of grabbed our, everything we could, and I just had my boots on, not even laced up. I had a helmet on. I didn't have my sidearms. But anyway, this shell came in and landed over here somewhere, and I turned my head and just got a shrapnel across the top of my head. Nicked my ear off, and, uh, or you know, part of my ear. Another one went over the top and hit the top of the helmet here. But anyway, I was bleeding down here, and and I had no idea what was happening or how I got hit. So I said, well, Billy, i am got to get to the aid station. So that's where I took off for the aid station. And uh, the aid station guy, one of the men at the battalion aid station, just wrapped my head in a bandage because I didn't even have my sidearms where my safe uh, first aid kit would be. So he wrapped, them, wrapped me up and says, go over in the hole there. And, Find a hole and stay till morning, which I did. And uh, I don't. I just must have fallen asleep or something because uh, when I when I came around in the daylight, I looked and crawled out of the hole and there's nobody there. The whole unit had pulled out while I was either sleeping or something in the hole there, and they were gone. They're were, they were on the move, and I was. I eventually got back to an aid station and. They, and I had a minor wound, you'd call it a walking wound, and they shipped me to England and did some surgery on my, my head. And I got back uh, six weeks later. It took me six weeks, mostly because it took so long. Well, they did spend time in the hospital, probably a week in the hospital. So that's my, that's my story. It's not any exciting battle, you know? And that's the way, unfortunately, the way uh, people get killed, or I mean, they just get killed, or they get hit. I mean, they're not doing anything spectacular. They're just there, and uh, with artillery and with mortar shells, you don't see who kills you or, or tries to kill you. You just try to avoid that. You, I don't know if you saw the uh, the uh, Battle Band of Brothers uh, films that have been on the HBO lately. Anyway, they, Stephen Ambrose and and uh, Tom Hanks have tried to make a series of this movie of this story of the 101st Airborne Company. And so many people are just killed just just standing, you know, doing nothing. And others are killed in a, in a, in a motion or attack. But at this stage, I, we weren't in any. We were beginning to go into the attack. So once again, second time in my Army career, I missed the big battle. Uh, I suppose if I hadn't missed it, I wouldn't be here. It's about the size of it. Because a lot of... But it was Saint, taking St. Lowe was a major effort, and within that was July. I, actually, it was the 11th of July when I was hit. And by the 28th or 9th of July, they took St. Lowe. And a few days later, the whole thing broke out, and Patton broke out of the, who didn't do anything except break out, uh, and take his tanks across Europe in a hurry, and the whole German army sort of fell apart. Uh, our unit continued to fight for a while until about August. And uh, then they were sent to out in the Britain Peninsula to take the big seaport of Brest, which took us a month to take. And I got back at that battle at Brest. 
And at that stage, I was welcomed back as a veteran. And uh, so one of the fellows that I did know uh, had become sar was a sergeant of the platoon, and he made me his runner. And I sort of got out of the rifle-carrying thing of attack, and I just carried messages from then on. So that was another thing that uh, saved my life, because uh, I didn't have to go over as over the top. And World War II, they actually, you know, I mean, they didn't go over the top, but they did have to go out and, and expose themselves in an area where, you know, you're going to get hurt. Yeah, I could have got hurt any time, too, because we lost a lot of runners. But that's the way it went. What type of uh, messages did you carry? Well, it boiled. It, 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 uh, maybe in the beginning, you simply, uh, the, the captain would want to know, see the lieutenant, or the lieutenant wanted to see the sergeant, or they want to get together. It wasn't like I carried great, important messages, although there were, you know, it was your job to communicate. One of the reasons was the communication was the first line of communication was a runner. I mean, uh, that was the hand-carried message or the, the verbal message. The second and the most uh, probably important one was sound power telephone. We had wires going up to every position that we had very long. And so if you stayed in a position you know, for a few hours, you tried to get a telephone line up to a person just on the ground and up to a phone that you could ring. And that way you could call it directly to right back right back to headquarters, right back to Supreme Headquarters if you wanted to. But I mean, but they had so many lines. It was you knew the army had been in a place by the number of wires that went across. I mean they didn't have multiple wires or whatever, you know, on one wire. They had just one wire carried one message to one telephone. And for every telephone you had to have a wire. So uh, the, the wiremen also did the same thing I did. They had to carry the, the wires out to, a, to positions. And I just had to find those positions or run out to them. And later on, I got uh, advanced to back to battalion headquarters. So I ran from battalion headquarters to the, to the company. And the, the primary thing we had to do every night was to carry the countersign, sign and countersign, because every night it changed. So I would get the countersign from somebody at headquarters, and then I'd take it out to the guys at the platoon or to the company. So at first I was a platoon runner, then I became a company runner. What is a sign and a countersign? Well, uh, it's, a, it's a combination of two words. You could, you could say babe, and the other answer would have to be Ruth. Babe Ruth. So the sign is, you know, and it's sometimes more, a little more than that, but it was some, something that the Germans couldn't pronounce too well, or they wouldn't know. And I do remember that, that the countersign for D-Day which, I, which we were all told was thunder, lightning, and, and, the, and, the, and the, sign, the, the counter sign was welcome. Now, the paratroopers used a little click, you know, that little cricket thing. They, if they came on somebody, they would click this little cricket because they knew they were going to be scattered all over and they would be running into people all the time. The counter sign, that sign of counter sign, was used a lot. If, if people went out on patrol and came back, and they were going to come back into our lines, and somebody would shoot at them if they didn't identify themselves. And you had to be careful to identify yourself. That was one of my problems. Is you had to make sure that the guy knew you were coming at him, and that you were friendly. And uh, you know, we had a number of cases where guys were, were trigger happy, and they didn't even listen to their color sign or didn't give it, and you were killed. And that was a, you know that was an important thing that you identified yourself. And the countersign was for the whole battlefield. It was, wasn't just for our unit. It was the same for everybody along. So if you really got scattered over and you, met, and you came back a few miles away in a different unit, it'd still be the same countersign. So it, that was a, one of the important things. The other thing we always carried from the battalion, they had to carry maps up to the company. That was a, for the change of whatever the plan was for the next day. My job was 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 more on my own, independently, you know, my job was to find the third platoon or find a company's headquarters. So when they moved out during the day, I would stay, no problem, and they would, guys would go up and attack. And we always buttoned down at night. Sometime we'd achieve an objective that we were, that was set out for the day, and hopefully they would get to that objective. But whatever 
I mean, I'd have to go out and find out where they were. And then, you know, bring the wire and, and ration parties and would move up and so forth. And we seldom fought all 40, 24 hours. It was generally, you button up somewhere in the dark. And in France, <laughs> that's in the summertime, the dark is 10.30 at night. And they have double British summertime and the, and the whole, it's, it's this much, much longer daylight in that area. I don't know exactly why. <laughs> Not up in Alaska, but that's somewhat similar. It's long hours of daylight, so we did button up around 10 o'clock or even before that, and uh, then they'd go off in the morning if there was an attack or a hole where they were. So it got to be a job of finding your way and finding your way back. So I got got to be good at that anyway. So, in what time frame are we talking about now? Oh, well, when I got back uh, to the company from coming from the hospital in September, we uh, eventually we were still in the process of capturing Brest, which was quite a, uh, a strong point. I don't know how many thousand German troops were, t were tied up in Brest, and the general did not surrender until the very last minute. So, one of the interesting things was getting down into the submarine pens because that's about where they surrendered was just before we got to right to the shore. We were coming from inland to the, sh to, the, to the city and through the city and down to the shore. And so the Germans did not surrender until the very last minute that they had no, no defenses left. But there were a lot of defenses around Brest and it was a major campaign. And I do remember getting down into the, you know, the submarine pens and so forth where thousands of British or German prisoners were, were surrendered. And most of them were at this stage, we're going naval fleet, you know, from the submarines, because that was a major uh, submarine base for the Germans. <clears throat> and then we were moved by 40 and 8 train, you know, that little, those little box cars, all the way across uh, France and taken up to uh, <clears throat> the end of September up to Germany, and right on the edge of the German border, the Dutch and German border. And it was from there we spent the next four months, I would say, probably longer than that taking a few villages, trying to get closer to the Rhine. We had one major river to cross, which was the Roar River, and that took us all winter. And <clears throat> in fact, we spent almost all the winter on the Roar River, primarily because the Germans had attacked in south of us at the Bulge. And so we were north of the Bulge, and we were not under direct attack in the Bulge. We were just stretched out a bit. And so we were in sort of a stagnant position. So I got to know the German towns of, uh, of the Rhineland uh, around the Ruhr River quite well. We had spent December, well, November, December, January, February, into the end of February before we began to move again. And by the end of February, or, or March, now we're in March, uh, we moved across the Rhineland, across the Rhine. We didn't have any problem crossing the Rhine at all, or even across to other places. And we got into one more major battle in the north of the Ruhr, uh, which was uh, the Ruhr was an industrial complex, Dusseldorf, Cologne, those major cities there. And uh, the Germans had a pocket in there. We, that was our last major battle. However, this was now in March and April. And uh, we didn't lose any. We lost one man, I think, in that whole uh, battle. And then uh, we were sent. Um, trucks crossed uh, up the Autobahn or along the Autobahn right to the factory of the Elbe River. And all we did there was to accept German surrenders. And we didn't really fight any campaigns, uh, although <laughs> it was very interesting. You know, the Germans were trying quickly to surrender to us as the Russians were coming into Berlin. And we were told we had to stop at the Elbe River. We couldn't advance any further. Although, I mentioned in my stories, Captain Rabbit, who was our commander of the company at this stage decided to cross on his own and went for a week or two with the Russians and found the Russians and had quite a good time with it. But he was on his own. And, uh, we were, we were, that was the end of the war for us. It was in, in May, early May, 45, that was VE day. So that's where he ended up, the unit ended up right on the Elbe River, just about 50 miles from Berlin. How long 
after the war ended, were you still in Europe? Well, you may remember that uh, we were still fighting the Japanese, and, uh, and there was a lot of, we were getting closer and closer to the Japanese homeland. And, in, and uh, so part of the thing was to, some of the troops were going to have to be transferred to the Pacific for the major assault against Japan. So, so June, July, and uh, August, troops were sent, being sent back from, the, from Germany, from Europe, to the states to re-outfit to go to, to the Pacific. So none of us really wanted to try that. I mean, and we fortunately, the high command assigned the 29th Division to be an occupation unit. And so our unit was not sent back to the United States, which we were happy with. The war was still going on in the Pacific. And so we were sent to Bremen in Bremerhaven, which was the American uh, occupied port that would bring supplies into the American still stationed in Germany, which were the German, or the American um, zone was in the southern part of Germany, in uh, Bavaria, that area. But we were assigned to this one seaport of Bremen, and so that, we occupied that through the summer of 1945. And about this time, the, uh, the, uh, began to rotate men back to the States as being just, you know, to get home because some, some had been over there three years or more. And uh, never, never had, I had one 48-hour pass in that whole year from D-Day until the end of the war, and that, that was a 48-hour pass to, to France. So that, that, was a, that was my one real fun trip, but and that was the middle of, of battles, you know, but I got one 24-hour pass to, to, to Paris. But at any rate, as the war ended uh, and the bomb was dropped in August, uh, then the whole thing changed. And uh, the unit stayed over there, but so many of us were shipped back. So I went back, I was back, and uh, yeah, I shipped out in September. It's okay if we take a quick break, because sure. we're run, running down. Run down on tape. After the war, uh, and you were occupying Europe. What was it like to go home? Well, the both wars had ended by now. At the, I got home, I think it was late September or October. And uh, it was a great time of reunions uh, with uh, so many of my friends who had all, basically we were all coming home about the same time. Uh, I didn't think back at all, and I didn't have any uh, nightmares. I did have a lot of resentment against guys in the service who never got overseas. You know, I joined the VFW because I wouldn't join the American Legion, because these guys were all stateside, I thought. And, uh, but otherwise, we, I wanted to get, I was wanted to go back to college, and uh, we had a, the state of New York, and I think the federal government had an unemployment insurance program. I said, as soon as you, you get so much, I forgot what it's, 52, 20, something like that. $52, I don't know what it was, so much, I forgot the name of it, but it was based on how many weeks we would be paid so much money for each week we were looking for a job. And of course, most of the guys were either going back to college or, or looking for a job. So for the first, month or so, we just hung out uh, together and uh, kept meeting somebody who had came back. Not everybody uh, came back, and although I met uh, one man who was a friend of mine in high school, and his brother, and two brothers, uh, he was killed in the same unit that I was in. I had no idea he was even in it. That's, you know, 15,000 troops in the, in the unit. But he was killed, and uh, I, I didn't know that he was even in the unit. He was killed a couple months after I was wounded, a month after I was wounded. And uh, we didn't talk about that. And we just talked about you know, getting started again. So it was really a, a great time. We looked forward to what was going to happen. Rather than come back, I don't think that anybody sat down and cried or anything. I think it's only when I got older. <laughs> I got tears.
And I guess that because it means more to me now than say what back in it. So I don't want to be defined totally by D Day, but the truth is that's probably true. You know, I had I had a life. I had a life that didn't have anything to do with military service. And I certainly didn't want anything to do with the military. Some guys stayed in the service. Not many though. Some stayed in the reserves. Some had better deals, you know, they, they got to be officers and, they, and so it was a good thing to join the reserves or keep in the service. And there were guys who just wanted that, but most of us wanted no part of it. I think the first thing I did with my uniform was dye it a different color. I didn't want to see the uniform the same color. So, so I think life went on. I, I don't think we look back on it. We knew that it was a terrible thing. It was best to get it over with and forget it and build our lives. I had spent two and a half years in the service, and others spent longer. Some were just some were just going back, going in. Some of the younger fellows were still going, were going in. They got unfortunately caught in the Korean affair, which came a couple years later. So. And that joining the service was a good idea. In fact, one of the lieutenants, I just discovered one of the lieutenants that uh, was in the command of one of our, our platoons, an excellent officer that was in charge of the third platoon, was killed in Korea as a captain. And he stayed with it. So we went on. That was the important thing. Did you go back to Niagara? I went back to Niagara, yep. Yeah, and I was a much better student. And we were all treated as a special group veterans, you know. We didn't want any part of hazing or student activity. We were just veterans. And we were a lot more serious about our job. Or, you know, we had fun time, but that fun. I think we were more serious about what school was all about. So it was a, I would say I didn't look back in, in, in any problem. There were people who had reasons to have nightmares. You know, and I know a lot of them who did, and had re uh, good reasons. I think the worst thing, and I talked to one, in fact, the, my, my, the flamethrower who was with me came back, and uh, one of the times he got hit, the, the foxhole collapsed on him, and uh, he didn't know where he was. Very, very. He didn't come out, when he came out, he didn't know his name. And he uh, spent a lot of time uh, in, Reconciling all that, he says he was frightened to death. And it was just the worst feeling. And I know several others who were buried alive in different ways, a couple others anyway. And that was the worst thing. And then when you get caught out in a field and you can't move, that's another bad thing. You see guys break down and you just can't can't handle it anymore. And a lot of guys that happened to. Them. And I just never got caught in that situation. So I was lucky. I'm sure I would have broke down somewhere. So it was good, good coming home. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, can you explain your medals, please? Well, yeah, so just briefly, uh, these are what I've had. I finally got them into a case I made myself, but uh, the uh, Starting at the, uh, this side, here is the uh, insignia of the 29th Division, the Blue and Gray, from the National Guard Company, or Division from Virginia and Maryland. The blue represents the north, and the gray represents the south. So it's not a Korean War symbol, <laughs> or Korean symbol. And the top one is the presidential citation, which was given to a unit, not to an individual and was given to our regiment for the landing at Normandy. And then the, yeah, I don't know if you can see the uh, oak leaf cluster, which was given to our battalion for capturing a hill in south of Vir after I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't really in the company at that time, but I was a member of the company, so I still could wear it. Then the, over here is the regimental insignia of the 116th Infantry Regiment, which came from Virginia and has a long history that goes back to the Revolution. In fact, it's called the Stonewall Brigade or the Stonewall Regiment after Stonewall Jackson because this, in the Civil War, this unit fought, of course, on the Confederate side and was called the Stonewall Brigade, even today. This badge here in the center is the Combat Infantry Badge, 
with the rifle and the wreath and is awarded to anybody who was a, a rifleman or in the infantry in combat. The Purple Heart for anybody wounded in battle and then the campaign ribbon which really doesn't have this normally on here. This was a tourist thing. They, they, they gave us this and so I just attached it. It's the same colors as the European Theater of Operation, or the ETO, which was the anybody who was in that operation could wear this ribbon. The first uh, little attachment is an arrowhead for the Normandy invasion. Then there are four battle stars, I believe, there, one for each battle across Europe. And there are four separate different battles, as they see. This is the bronze star. And that was an individual award, uh, but then again, later on, many years later, the State or the Defense Department decided to issue everybody who was in combat in Europe or in the war, World War II, a Bronze Star. So it got to be diminished a little bit. So that's the that's the cluster. I only really got it once. And this is the New York State Medal, and this is a medal awarded by the Province of Normandy in France for the 45th uh, or 50th anniversary of D-Day. So that's that's a, a gift from the government of France, you might say. And the French people have some, they love medals. And I have a picture of me. The man is kissing my cheek as he's giving me this medal. <laughs> they love to do that. So they're, they're very big on medals. And frankly, I was, and most of us in the service were not very big on medals. We didn't even think about this or this until the war was over when um, a point system was set up by, the, uh, by Eisenhower, awarding so many points for medals and so many points for being in the service so many months and the highest number of points that the fellow would go home first. And it was a fair system to send people who had been overseas and into many battles you know, over a long period of time, those people went home first. So then we began to get interested in medals because five points were awarded for that. I don't know how many points were awarded for that and uh, so many points for each of the campaign stars that we had. So we began to pay attention to that, but up to that point, not one of us cared about a medal. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay.